Dave Chesson is an internet marketing mastermind and the creator of Publisher Rocket. He is a husband, a father, and an online entrepreneur specializing in Kindle ebook marketing. Dave, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. You began your adult journey by uh, diving into the U.S. Well, sorry about that pun. Going into the U.S. Navy. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you did there? Sure. Well, the tell you the truth, the reason why I joined was my father, grandfather, great grandfather were all in the military. Matter of fact, just about every male in my family was in the Navy except for one black sheep, and he went Air Force. <laughs> so it's just a legacy thing for us. Does that cause and tension at family holidays around the table? <laughs> just a bit. <sighs> you know, anybody who who's been in the military knows that with the uh, with the Air Force, uh, they always had the nicest things and the best golf courses, et cetera. <laughs> But we're still more proud to be in the Navy. So <laughs> fun family conversations. Yes. Um, I actually went into nuclear engineering. I was a submariner. And uh, oh, cool. for officers in the submarine, uh, you have to be a nuclear engineer first. So I got to drive those. It sounds like a lot of fun, but actually it sucked. Really? <laughs> There's no better way to put it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a submarine is like 150 dudes stuck in a steel steel can. Uh, underwater for three months, no light of day. I mean, Freud would have had a phenomenal time recording <laughs> Submariners and our emotional schedules, shall we say. <laughs> so I, it wasn't exactly my cup of tea. I mean, I'm, I'm a big physics nerd, and I love it. Yeah. However, comma, they don't let you shoot from the hip when you're operating a reactor, so it wasn't what? my thing. I know, right? You would think they would just be like, ah, go with how, what you feel. No, right. I mean, no. What, what what happened? You know, putting faith in, in your in your men and right. That, yeah, crazy. no, you you're supposed to stick to the 200 plus reactor manuals and go yeah. with it. So I was like, right. ah, fine. I'm out. <laughs> right, peace out. Right. <laughs> so I I switched over to an area that I've just always had a love. Uh, I was I love Chinese. I, I don't know why, but for some reason, I love the language. I love the culture. I mean, yeah, I love American Chinese food, too. But uh, <laughs> I don't know what it was. I was really drawn to it. And so I found out that I could be a military diplomat. Wow. So I studied for that. I proved to the military I'd make a great uh, Chinese diplomat. And then they sent me to school, got my master's degree in East Asia, uh, sent me to DLI, became fluent in Mandarin Chinese, which is fun when I go to the Chinese restaurants now. I can uh, imagine. I don't, it's even I don't funnier. They, they have too many customers who can pull that off. Right. Yeah. It, it's it's actually a shock, but it's even funnier when it's uh, Cantonese and I'm Mandarin. So I'm like, <laughs> oh, ni hao, wo jiao chong hong. And they're like, dude, we're Cantonese. I'm like, <laughs> darn it. Should have listened first. Well, they, can they understand the Mandarin or are they just looking at you like this guy's just pretending? They, like, <laughs> they know that it's legit Chinese, no. <laughs> uh, Mandarin Chinese. However, they're like, they don't know it. They're completely different languages, although wow. the same written language. So yeah. I went into a military diplomacy and I was all specialized in China and they sent me to Korea. I was like, ah, you know, this is not the same place, right? <laughs> and no, they don't speak English where you they think, sent me yeah, you and think they don't they speak Chinese. <laughs> I, I know. And then the next assignment was Sri Lanka. So I was like, oh, we're well, hmm, we're getting further away from China, but oh well. <laughs> so that right there in a nutshell is pretty much my military background so what are you like a hundred years old having done all that <laughs> so, that is insane <laughs> yeah it was it was a lot of fun i, I will say that I, i'm very proud to have served and i'm very thankful for all the things that the uh military did for me mm -hmm. all the education they gave me the the training sending me all over the place it was sure. it was awesome yeah well we definitely appreciate your service uh as well so we know you're a tech genius. Uh, do you also do some writing of your own? Yes. Uh, what's funny is I'm actually dyslexic, and um, I've always struggled throughout my life with writing. It, it's, you know, when you grow up with <clears throat> some kind of hindrance or something that really makes you feel as though you're less than everybody else, you kind of like you wear it. You know, you're like, yeah. I'm not meant to write. I was that kid. I, I did everything in my life to basically say that writing's not for me. That's probably a big reason as to why I studied physics, because it was this 
far away from English as possible. <laughs> and but it, it even though you tell yourself that it does not mean that all of a sudden you don't want to write or you have no desire for it. I mean, truly in my heart, I always wanted to, I always wanted to. And it wasn't until I was in Korea, uh, the military sent me to Korea without my family. So Mm. my wife and kids were back in the U S and this was my time of saying, okay, I'm going to make something extra of my time. I'm going to do a good job for the military. But when I come home, I'm, I'm working on something more. And that's when I really decided that I wanted to write. The problem was, was that I wasn't a good writer. I mean, l- let's face it. When we first really start writing, we're not that great. Right. <laughs> it's a lot. We need a lot of practice. <laughs> and one less life lesson that I've always found, especially in military diplomacy, is that you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You don't have to be the best writer or so. But when you have some information that everybody in that room wants you're probably the most important person there is, right? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to writing, if you understand what it is that people want and you are providing a clear-cut message that says, I know what it is you want and I'm presenting that, you don't have to be Ernest Hemingway, but you will get a lot of very happy customers because you not only had the information, but you provide it for them in a clear-cut manner. And so that's when I started to realize that I could really do this writing was just by understanding what the market wanted. Is that what uh, what's called writing to market? Is that the same thing? Or yes, uh, although, and I, I do love the, the term writing to market, but it's also a bit more than that. Like for example, there are times where I started with a subject that I wanted to. Uh, let's go ahead and give an example of one that I actually didn't follow through on, but mm-hmm. uh, should have back in the day, and it'll be clear as to why I don't do it now. But uh, about Four or five years ago, Evernote used to be a really big thing, uh, especially in writing books on it. Um, It's a great program. I still use it. It's phenomenal in collecting your notes, helps me to create anecdotes for for my books. Highly recommend authors check it out. However, though, a couple of years ago, they changed their pricing and it kind of got wonky and it's not as awesome as it used to be. So the popularity of the thing dropped pretty quickly. But back in that day, though, people were writing books all the time about how to use Evernote, et cetera. And it was crowded. And even though I had a very unique approach to it, I knew exactly how to organize it uh, more so than most of these people. And a lot of those books are actually pretty bad. Uh, It was just too many people. So I did my research and I found out that there was a legitimate amount of people who were typing into Amazon Evernote for authors. Evernote for students, Evernote for project managers, Evernote for lawyers, and there was another one. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but there were significant amounts of demographics that were sectioning themselves off from this, and it could provide an opportunity to write exactly that book and truly meet that market. Imagine that you are a student and you type in Evernote for students. And there's only one book with that title or one book that says this is Evernote written solely for you. Right. Yeah. Guess who gets the sale. (laughs) Right. I mean, you don't have to be the best, but you have spoken to them and you have written for them. And it did it make me write some book I didn't want to write. No, Mm. it helped me to reach people that wanted it. So, uh, yeah, right to market is one thing, but in truth, doing that kind of research can help you really break through the incredibly difficult competition out there, get your book in front of the right people, and really help. That's amazing. So I, I want to go back just a, a minute to something, because I feel like this is something that you've been opening up more recently about, and that's your dyslexia. Uh, is there something uh, in addition that you could offer to others, possibly? Because I'm, I'm sure there are others watching who are struggling with the same same issue and that you know feel the same way that you did. How, how did you did you give us some more about, more about how you broke through that? Uh, bourbon? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my solution to everything. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think it was. When I was writing my first book, I was like so nervous and I was so scared. And I, I, I definitely used a couple of editors, that's for sure. My wife being one of them, that poor lady. <laughs> um, 
but I think a lot of it was I had a real goal. Like I wasn't just writing to just write. I wasn't writing for some arbitrary monetary value. Uh, for me, I was writing one to kind of answer something that I really wanted to do, you know, some kind of itch that was nagging. But more importantly, I was trying to look for a way to make enough money so that I could get out of the military and be home with my kids. Mm -hmm. And it was a goal of my wife's mind to, to, to do exactly that. So for me, I needed to get past any of my own hesitation and fears and really work towards something. So my goal wasn't just something small like, oh, I'd like a little bit of more money or a little more more money. It right. was, I wanted to be home with my children. So for that, dyslexia, whatever, you know, uh, there's a great quote by an admiral that says, darn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. <laughs> and uh, I was like, all right, I had to clean that up because, of course, it was an admiral and there was definitely curse words right. in there. <laughs> <laughs> Sailors, you know. Um, yeah. Well, you would know that. Um well, it sounds like you had a lot of support, like, like your wife was very supportive, for example, and your family. And on top of that, your family was also one of the key motivators. And so I think motivation is is uh, a, a key factor there. So you've got a background, obviously, in tech things. And there's one thing I want to touch on, which was SEO, because a lot mm -hmm. of people I talk to don't understand it at all. Um, and there's people like me who just know what the acronym is, and that's about it. Could you maybe explain to us a little bit about what SEO actually is? Sure. Uh, SEO is search engine optimization, and it's the process of convincing a search engine like Google or Amazon, mm -hmm. right, uh, to place your product or your article at the top of the list when people search using a certain term. So we could, uh, Amazon SEO, right, in particular is an example is that people will go to Amazon, they go to that search bar at the top, they type something in, they hit search, and then Amazon presents them with a list of products. For SEO, say you have a product, you're trying to maneuver your product so that Amazon, when somebody types in that particular phrase, Amazon's like, oh, let's put this product up at the top. This can be extremely important because if you're, in, in this case, books, if your book ranks number one for that particular search term, 27%, statistically speaking, 27% of the people that type it in will click on your book at the top. But then that quickly drops to 13% at number two, and then 11 at number three, and then nine, eight, seven, six, 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 and then seven at the bottom. And it goes up because we always scroll down to the bottom, and then we see the last one a <laughs> okay. little bit more. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, yeah that makes sense, though. Because I've done um, it myself. So as you can see, ranking number one over number two, you get two times more people going to your book than if you're number two. And on top of that, too, statistically speaking, like it's much better to be number one for a keyword term that has 100 people per month typing it in, or excuse me, 1,000 people typing it in than one that only has 100. So this is a process that can really help great books to be discovered. We can go over to another search engine, Google. If you have a blog and you're trying to write an article, the same exact principles I talked about are there as well, except the number, the percentage is actually higher. In Google, if you write and your article shows up number one at the top, it's something like 40% of people that type it in will click on that first article. But then it like drops by a half to number two and so forth. Hmm. So... It's really unique. One thing I do love about SEO, whether it's for Google or for Amazon, is that when you do rank number one for something, you can expect traffic to your article or to your book every day and every month, whether you're doing something or not. And for me, I love the idea that my content and hard work is going to continue to pay off every day. So at like kindlepreneur.com, we get over 200,000 unique visitors every month to the website. And that's not because of social media. It's not because we're having to work every day to convince people to come over. We're not having to pay advertisement to get people. That's because people go to Google and they type in terms like book cover design or book editors or Kindle keywords or, you know, how to add more categories. I mean, all of these different types of phrases and we're right there at the top. And so they click. 
they start engaging with the content. They're hopefully they're like, wow, this is great. This guy, you know, is giving me great information and I can't tell he has dyslexia and the writing's good. <laughs> and they start digging in and reading more. Well, I know that works because that's how I found how I found you and been following you for a while now. <clears throat> all stalker like but <laughs> yeah awesome <laughs> that that's the funny thing about those those of us who are going to make a go of it online we sort of invite stalkers you want to stalk sure go come right ahead <laughs> oh yeah hey <laughs> so what one thing that i i got out of your training that was key for me is to understand kind of what we were just talking about which is that amazon is a search engine I Absolutely. think that is a, a, a mindset that can really kind of change your life in terms of selling, again, in this case, books. Um, that they are a search engine specifically designed to sell things. That's what they want to do, unlike Google, which is sort of serving up information. Um, so that, that was key for me. So I just want to say thanks for that. That kind of flipped a switch for me. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Yes. I, you know, it's even more important for Amazon to get that right. Imagine going to Amazon and typing something in and not seeing anything you're looking for and doing <laughs> that over and over and over again. Tell me, even though they may have the right product somewhere on that, that website, and it may be the best price product, if you can't find what you're looking for, Amazon's dead to you. Right. So their survival isn't just about having everything isn't about the pricing, isn't about the cool layout of the website or Jeff Bezos and funny commercials. It is about its ability to get the right product to the customer. I don't remember the exact quote, but Bezos himself, the creator and um, main owner of Amazon, has said something to those exact lines of like, our livelihood or lifeblood is the ability to get the right product to the right customer. Right. And you know, I always think of that when I hear you know, some people, and there are certain ins instances when I think this may be true, but in general, it, it's sort of, well, you know, people complain that Amazon's working against me or they're hiding my product or something. And most of the time, that isn't the case because, as, as you said, it's in Amazon's best interest to serve that up. It's just a matter of kind of demystifying how it works. Uh, and you've done some great, great work on, on that end. So, Thanks. you know, writing a book is one thing. But once we write it, we want to get it onto people's e-readers. Otherwise, in large, in large extent, there's no point in writing it at all, which means we need help. But, you know, myself and most of the writers I know are not naturally business savvy. It's not something creative types typically excel at. So to that end, uh, you've created this amazing tool called Publisher Rocket. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? For example, how did you come up with the idea for Publisher Rocket? Yeah. So when I was first writing my books back in the day, I had this elaborate, super hardcore Excel sheet that helped me to figure out the right terms, right? We were talking about Evernote. Well, the process that I used to figure out that there was Evernote for writers and Evernote for students and Evernote for project managers and lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. It was a very long and tedious product process. It wasn't just looking for Amazon suggestions. It was looking for viable options. Were these books selling? Were people, how many people per month were typing this into Amazon? And that's not something you can readily find. <laughs> so I had this entire process and selfishly, I kind of thought, man, it would be nice if I had a program that just kind of figured this out for me. <laughs> and I was like, ah, you know, some of the best stuff comes when you ask yourself that, right? right. <laughs> so I got together a team of programmers and we put together uh, Publisher Rocket. Now, when we first came out with it, which was almost three years ago, all it was was keyword research and competition analyzer. So it would help you to find the right keywords for your book so it could get discovered. And then it would also help you to analyze the competition so you could figure out what they're doing, how well they're selling, how much money they're making, those sorts of things. So that you would know who you'd be kind of competing against when you try to go for that keyword. But since then, though, we've added so much to it. For example, Amazon ads have been phenomenal. So, of course, but the problem about it is you have to come up with a lot of particular types of keywords. So we created a system that will help authors gather those much uh, more effectively and efficiently. Mm -hmm. Then we created a category feature that um, helps you to track down there are over 22,000 subcategories on Amazon. Oh jeez. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, believe me, I have a team that's indexing every one of them. Oh, my it's God. Just, it's it's horrific when you see it. <laughs> but here's the funny part is that when authors go to publish their book for the first time, they're presented by Amazon some 300 categories or so to choose from. Those are what's called BISAC. I don't remember what it, the 
abbreviation stands for, but it's basically like the universal categories that all bookstores have accepted. Mm -hmm. And so when you're choosing from those 300, you're pretty much picking the most competitive possible categories out there, right? Because everybody has to choose from there. But you can actually, there's a process for you to add not only more than the three they allow you to choose, but you can actually get 10. And you can choose from the 22,000, which believe me, there's a lot of less competitive categories out there. <laughs> but for authors, the hardest part is, okay, how do I find the right one out of the 22,000 categories? Right. So we created a system that helps them do that. And uh, so Publisher Rocket is basically a program that helps authors to understand what's going on in the market, choose the right keywords so that their book gets, gets discovered, find the right categories so that they are not competing against the hard ones and can have a much easier time hitting a legit bestseller status. And if you do advertisement, believe me, it's going to save you hours to be able to use that feature yeah. every week. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I, I know that from experience. I have Publisher Rocket. And every time I boot it up and work with it, it is just, <clears throat> it is mind blowing. Like I well, think of the countless hours I would have to spend to get that information and it wouldn't even be as good as what I just got. <laughs> nice. Well, you're going to like version 2.0. It's coming out hopefully in a day or two here. We're, nice. we're just, we're just finalizing on some little pieces. Um, it's really exciting. I'm really jazzed about it because we added so much to it that kind of the core system of the program started to be like, ah, too much weight, too much weight. <laughs> so we had to redesign it from the from the ground up. But it gave us an opportunity to really like kind of flex our muscles and find some extra things that we could do that we didn't think we could do. Uh, we've added more uh, capabilities. We've also updated to reflect Amazon's new changes in ads. So we've included like ASIN numbers and targeting um so that's been really cool. But I'm most excited about the categories because unlike before, like in our version 1.0, you'd have to type in certain phrases and Rocket would go find these categories. But now what we did was we actually put all 22,000 categories inside Rocket and you can use filters to actually see what potential categories all in a list you can use. So you yeah. would start by selecting like book or ebook. Um, so then it would you know, kind of filter out whichever one you didn't choose. Then you could choose fiction or nonfiction. And we're adding things like you could click erotica if you want to make sure you don't have any erotica categories show up, or maybe that's what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with like short reads. And we're breaking it down where you can also type in words. And if that category has that word in it, it will lay it out for you. And so this way, for the first time, authors can have the ability to see every potential category in a list and be able to quickly find what they're looking for. So, God, that's crazy. Give. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to anybody who does have Rocket, uh, it's going to be a free upgrade. I'm not a fan of software companies that charge a customer more because they made their product better. So yeah. if you have it, you, you'll get that update uh, automatically without having to pull out your wallet. So Nice. My wallet thanks you. <laughs> <laughs> So how Cheers did you? <laughs> yay! How the hell did you do that? Now, so did you get a peek under the hood at Amazon, or, or did you just do a hell of a lot of trial and error? Or how how did that work? It's really a, a large combination of things. Um, one big aspect that's really helped us to make sure that we always kind of stay um, um, accurate is that we have a couple of deals with publishing companies where they allow us kind of access to some of their information so that we can verify. And by publishing company, companies, I mean with large ones that are selling all over the spectrum from ridiculously popular to died years ago. <laughs> and so we're able to kind of look at their data and verify that, yep, you know, because a Amazon's a dynamic system. And yeah. so that really helps us to stay very accurate. We also we have access uh, to some components to Amazon that gives us a lot more information than a regular person could. And then, of course, we have, you know, team of people that are always working to kind of monitor and check and manually do things. Um, it's it's actually a little, little known, but I actually have 17 people that work for me. Wow. So, yeah, it's it's a fun company. <laughs> that, that's quite a team. I, that's <laughs> You've definitely built something special there. Uh, what's the number one thing, and maybe we already answered this, but what's the number one thing authors get wrong about marketing? that you start it when you hit publish. 
I, I think <laughs> right. That's uh, good. <laughs> and that's not just that's not just, you know, um, I have a plan and then I start the plan. I mean, it is straight up like. Yeah, I, I'm going to write my book, I'm going to finish it, and then I'll worry about the marketing after I hit publish that that could be like probably the biggest book killer <clears throat> thing ever. I, I say the day you decide you want to write is the day that you need to start marketing. And that's not from a salesy way of like you're trying to sell your book before you even put the first word. What it is is that it gets you in the right mentality. It gets you to start talking to your target market. It gets you to start understanding what people like. It can help you with the writing process. And as you do this, it starts to build people around you that you can leverage or you know work with later on when you publish your book. But the point, though, is, is that all of these things take time. And some of the best marketing efforts are the one where you actually put the time into it and you're going to get the best results. So I say, again, the day you decide to start writing that book is the day you need to start thinking about the marketing and start working that. And that's a huge hurdle, I think. I know it is for a lot of people that, you know, writers that I know. And even for myself earlier on, it was because that's not really what we want to hear. I think you know, as writers, we're, you know, we're creative types and we want to create something and then move on to the next creation. Um, but to make it a viable enterprise, one must start approaching their writing like a business. And the day that I came to grips with that or accepted that notion was the day that things started turning around a little bit. So, yeah. It, and ultimately, I think it made me a better writer. It made me more invested in what I'm doing. And so it was a good thing. It was just difficult to accept that first off, because I think I had this romantic idea of being a writer, you know, and it's so much more than that. <laughs> well, one one thing I've, I've found that there are some people that are like, you know, when I started, I was all about like, look, I'm, I'm using I want to use this skill and this craft to be able to be home with my kids. OK, so right. there was a financial focus, right? It wasn't just about I want to write. OK, so for that motivation, there's that. But when I'm working with somebody who's like, look, I'm an artist, I just want to write, you know, here's my take on that marketing part and a really good mental shift for people is that marketing isn't just about being a greasy car salesman or being about the numbers or any of that stuff that, you know, some people are very opposed to, right? Marketing is about connecting the right thing to the right person and their needs, you know, it's about crafting something that helps people. Mm -hmm. And when you start to look at that, sometimes, you know, if you're like, I just want to write and I want people to read my book, it's going to take marketing to get your good book into the right person's hands. You know, right. I love sci-fi military. My muzzy, my, my grandmother does not, <laughs> right? You could give her the greatest sci-fi military book in the world and she's going to pick it up and th think, this the sucks, <laughs> right? It doesn't mean the book sucks. It's that the process and the marketing of somehow convincing her to read that book uh, sucked. Right. So I would say, you know, writing a great book and then not putting in the proper marketing for it does a disservice to your readers. It does a disservice to the people out there and it does a disservice to your work. Yeah. Well, nobody wants a bad book review from Muzzy, so do your research. <laughs> Is it possible uh, to market a bad book? Well, or to successfully market a bad book, I should say. You know, one of the things I love most about the um, Amazon search engine is that it's pretty self-correcting in that mm. you could have a bad book. You could do all these great marketing things. You could convince it to put it at the top. You could do these great ads. But a big part of its calculation is not only did people buy it, right, but how did people like it? Reviews right. take place. And if that book has, you know, 51 stars, no matter what, it will <laughs> drop down to the bottom because Amazon doesn't want to continue to provide bad products. Right. So, you know, you could you could get it started, but uh, it it's uh at one point Amazon's going to catch up. Amazon's right. going to figure it out and the customers will become more aware. Right. I I think partly that may depend too as I'm thinking about my own question was it may depend on what the definition of bad is cuz I know a lot of us I'm sitting I'm sitting here thinking of a couple examples of books like how in the world 
did that take off. But it goes back to your point was that it was meeting some sort of need for right. people. And I think, you know, in terms of marketing, that is the test of whether or not something is a bad book or a bad product or not. Does it do its job? Does it fulfill a need that, that people have? Um, <clears throat> what would you say to an unknown author just starting out? Uh, maybe they feel like this whole writing marketing thing is just a mountain too steep to climb. What would you say to those people? Figure out why it is you want to climb the mountain first. You know, yeah, um, you're, you're good. <laughs> you're just... <laughs> yeah. If you don't understand why that is, this is an insurmountable task. But when you're clearly, when you've clearly defined what that is and why you're truly doing it, use that motivation. 